Okay, finally, let's talk about the fifth step in this webinar. This has to do with your actual imaging part. When you say get a publishable image, often people think that that has to do just with your actual imaging on the instrument. But as I've pointed out, the first four steps here are actually everything before that. What's the point in imaging something that's not already optimized with all those other techniques? Your image isn't going to be publishable unless you're able to do all those optimizations ahead of time. But now let's talk about the instruments and the software and hardware. First off, here is the, um, you can see an image of a typical objective lens that's used in a microscope. Um, there's a lot of different aspects in choosing an objective, but generally you want to go with the best possible objective, usually an apochromatic or S-apo or super apochromatic is your best because it corrects for chromatic aberrations in color and planar aberrations. So it's all about getting an image that is nice and uniform and co-localizes between colors very easily. And of course, you want to consider the magnification. How high do you want to go? Using oil will give you a brighter, more resolved image, but of course, oil has its own issues. Uh, I won't talk too much about choosing objectives here beyond that. But what are some things that you need to do about objectives and the lenses in order to get the best, most publishable image? Well, first off, make sure that your slides and cover slips are clean and dust-free before you begin your assay, and that your objectives are regularly cleaned and inspected, because you don't want dust or, or debris or, or buffer that's been dripped on it to reduce your resolution. And choose your objective lenses wisely, as I mentioned. Also, the light source in your instrument. Uh, most traditional light sources are uh, like a mercury lamp which you have to align. You have to make sure that your lamp is well, well aligned and of the right intensity uh, with your system, or in confocal systems, aligning your lasers. Mercury bulbs do go bad over time, so you have to consider their age and stability. At the bottom, that black and white graph is sort of an example of how the intensity decreases over time, and then you have to replace the lamp, and it's a little unstable at first, then it decreases over time. Our, our EVO systems don't have that problem. Also, align your condenser. If you're doing transmitted light imaging, the condenser lens under the stage for an upright scope or over the stage for an inverted scope has to be aligned and have what's called kohler illumination. That's where they, you center the condenser and try to get the best illumination. And those lenses have to be clean too. Here's an example of a traditional microscope where um, in the blue line you see the, the, the light, the excitation light for fluorescence travels from the, um, the mercury bulb, bounces off the dichroic mirror in the uh, filter cube and then down to, through the objective to the sample on the stage. The dye then gives off a wavelength that's higher, like in the green line here, that goes back up through the filter set to your eyes or the camera. In the red is a transmitted light from a tungsten bulb, for instance, that goes up through the condenser, through the sample, and then up to your eyes or the camera. And there's a picture of an icon scope at the bottom as an example. However, what we sell here are the EVOS microscopes. EVOS microscopes have a lot of great characteristics about them. One is that, uh, well, first off, there's no eyepieces, right? But also, it has a very short path length for the light, which means that you're going to get a brighter signal, and that's very important for a publishable image, get a nice, bright signal. And it also uses a um, light cube. We sell our Evos light cubes that have the light and LED lamp built into it. So there's no more aligning of mercury bulbs or having to replace mercury bulbs or, or discarding the mercury in a safe manner. Now it's built into that filter cube, so you get a nice, even illumination every time without it going bad. It's good for 50,000 hours. And you have built into this light cube the excitation and emission filters for that family of dyes. 
for instance, a GFP-like cube will have those filters for GFP or fluorescein. And you can see the same, uh, this is an inverted microscope, so you can see that uh, it's the opposite of what the scope was I showed before, where all of the fluorescence is down below in the bottom, going up to your sample and back down to the camera. Notice there's no eyepieces, so you're imaging through the um, monitor. At the top is a one of our EVOS FL Auto automated microscopes, and at the bottom there is our brand new FL Auto 2, the newer version of our automated microscope. Here's some examples of some hardware that has not been optimized. On the left is a image of some DAPI labeled nuclei, and you can see that they're dimmer on the upper right compared to the lower left. That's because this was taken on a traditional microscope where the mercury bulb was not aligned properly. And so you get a brighter sample. If you were to move this sample left or right on the stage, you'd see that the field of view is always going to be dimmer in the upper right. So you'd have to realign. And then to the right is an uh, image of an objective lens that has not been properly cleaned. You can see that there's some dust and debris there, which will reduce your resolution and might cause other optical artifacts. Um, and sometimes fibers can be autofluorescent as well. You can also see a little bit of damage to the objective there where it has scraped against the stage. Always got to be careful about that. If you want to learn more about our EVOS microscopes, there's a link for you at thermofisher.com slash EVOS. Remember, proper hardware means you get the most efficient detection.